This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. And by Ting.com. Head over to last.ting.com and save $25 off your first device. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 28, Episode 2. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Good morning to you, Matt. Good morning. I got a great show planned. I'm looking forward to it. Should we tell folks about it? Oh, yeah. So uh, you and I have had one particular request come into the inbox over the years that we've really never gotten around to answering. One, because we didn't have a great answer for it. Well, it was kind of hard to bring it all together, right? And then two... Oh, there's a little legal issues we have to dance it around. It gets a little about. gray, a little fuzzy. This mm -hmm. week, we're going to cover backing up and playing Blu-rays on Linux. And, you know, we've got the Blu-rays here. We're not talking about pirating, folks. We're talking about legitimately backing up the copies yep. that you own of the content. Now, the uh, Back to the Future set you've got right there, mm -hmm. Matt. Mm -hmm. Not even kidding. It's almost like it was meant to be for this episode. Right. I rescued uh, <laughs> movie one from the clutches of my four-year-old last night. Uh, yeah, these are practical I did, concerns. You I have did pretty here. good, actually. Oh yeah, I yeah, did yeah. pretty good. But the children love these things because oh, sure. they're shiny, and you can yeah. throw them, and you can hurt your Frisbees, siblings with Ninja them. Stars, mm -hmm. right? I mean, come on. Yeah. And they break really cool too. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. So, oh yeah. So uh, <laughs> this has been this has become something that you yeah. know when you buy these things like right. this is a seventy-dollar set, right? Star Trek, when it comes out, $100 a season. So you're talking, this is a serious investment. You want to make right. sure you have it protected. So we're going to talk about that. Then we're going to talk about protecting your wireless network by replacing the default firmware with a Linux-powered firmware that gives you a lot more options yeah. and gives you a lot more geek oh, tools yeah. as well. Mm. I just recently reflashed my home router with a uh, replacement um, firmware, nice. and I'll tell you all about that. Looking forward to that, boy. Matt, tell you. Uh, in the news segment, we're going to introduce something new, the Ooh. X11 Death Watch. We've got some stories uh, uh, and it's nice. not all it's not all Wayland, nope. but I'm going to warn you, Matt. But it's Wayland heavy. There, yeah. <laughs> it weighs heavy on my land. <laughs> it does something. Yeah. So I'm just just uh, getting just want to let you know, Matt. Just preparing you for that. Then uh, we've also got a great feedback segment with some really great questions that'll come up towards the end of the show. Good so heck stuff. of a show, Matt. Heck, heck of, of a show. show. Should we get started with the picks? Let's rock and roll. Now. Uh, I saw a couple of picks come in this week. It was really hard to choose. Now That's remember, good. we brought it home last week with mm -hmm. our pick. Uh, and there's some really great bringing home. I'm going to save those because we got one more this week that, uh, well, sometimes Linux shows up on the map, and they show up on the map in a big way. That's right. Our Russian ambassador, Steven Seagal, runs <laughs> Linux. Uh, this, was, this was taken from a screen cap of um, one You almost of think his, he would be more of a BSD guy. One of yeah. his fine productions. Uh, thanks to uh, Amonma. Uh, Amonima? That, uh, sent yeah, sounds in. right. You can see right there. It looks like it's oh a little bit, a little bit older version of Unity. It is totally, isn't it? And wow. uh, what app is that? I can't quite I make know. out it. It looks like it's. Hmm. Wow. I can't. I can't. I mean, the, the that looks like a waveform right almost, there, right? Yeah, it looks like a uh, some sort of audio yeah. editor. Yeah. That's crazy. That looks like a map there. Uh, anyways, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Huh. Uh, so I guess the chat, the uh, people in the thread figured out that this is from his uh, True Justice show, Angel of Death oh, okay. episode. Um, wow, never even heard of this until yeah. I. This, you know, this put it on my radar, but people love it when, when the, uh, whenever, whenever there's a celebrity signing and runs Linux, I get tons and tons and tons of email on it, so I figured mm -hmm. we got to cover this one right now. That's crazy. Now, it's not all, uh, it's not all uh, roses for runs Linux this week, man. Uh -oh. There's also a bit of a heavy one. Uh, uh -oh. The NSA. Oh, of course. Yeah, the NSA oh, runs Linux. The uh, key score system that allows the NSA to filter and analyze all of the metadata collected is powered by a cluster of Linux servers, according wow. to an NSA si slideshow that came out this week. <laughs> of course they have a slideshow for it, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, on a uh, Linux cluster, in, w in, one, in one slide, they say it's 500 Linux servers. Whoa. In another slide, they say it's 400 Linux servers. A little misinformation. That's what they do. And this is from 2008, so now it's probably sure. even greater than that. We covered uh, more detail in Unfilter 61. Uh, we talked in in NSA we trust. We talked about uh, the slideshow and kind of had some fun with the fact that it runs Linux. So Man, you got your you got your uh, you got your good things that run Linux, right? Like your Steven Seagal's out there, right? Right. Yeah, your totally. Russian ambassadors, and you got your with his running, you know, I mean, right? Goodness. Right. He is a ninja. Steven, you ever seen Steven Seagal run? I, it's it's if Google it and YouTube it and you'll understand. Really? Now, those of you guys that know what I'm talking about are probably going, yeah, you understand. It's it's truly uh, uh he kind of runs with his hands like a. Oh, you're not kidding. Yeah, no, I'm completely serious. Oh, okay, here we yeah, go. Yeah, he really, really... Uh, yeah, this just... <laughs> he, run, he, he, he runs like a pterodactyl. Ex Boy, he's... 
I mean, he, he the man can move, and trust me, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell that to his face. He was fit back in the day, wasn't he? Spin kick me. He was tomorrow. fit. Oh, he's very fit back in the day. Yeah, back. And as he's kind of like you know, as his ponytail got a little longer, he got a little more of him. So. Oh, that's that's. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. He kind of. <laughs> oh, okay. Well. Yeah. So that we went we went down a rabbit hole. I never thought yeah. we'd go down on this show. Uh, Steven Seagal does kind of I'm telling you. You know, not he runs Linux, but he also uh, you know, runs with his arms flailing. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that, Stephen. We're uh, big fans. Yeah. Really. yeah. Sure. Uh, all right. Okay. Some uh, really fun picks this week. One that really fits in with our theme of multimedia mm -hmm. and managing your media Yeesh. collection. And another one, well, this one is something that it's, it's an itch that I've been wanting to scratch for a real long time. Google's oh, yeah. working on it with Chromecast. Apple has AirPlay. but yeah, uh, Everybody's kind of got their own version or variation of it. We've got a solution for you, too, Matt. we got a solution for you, nice. too. But first, I want to thank this week's sponsor, GoDaddy.com. Woohoo! Now, I got, I got some great, great news. Great, oh, great yeah? news. So a lot of you know that I have a close personal friend, race car driver. She's, a, she's associated with the world's largest domain name registrar. Uh, she... Sometimes yeah, she does the in, she does intros for uh, mm -hmm. Linux podcasts out there. Well, at That's least right. one Linux podcast. Uh, she does a couple. Yeah, well, does no, us. She does us. Oh, what? Uh, she does the uh, you know. I'm you know, sorry. Always. I'm sorry. What? Uh, <laughs> the, the intro. Okay. <laughs> the intro. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Man. Just saying. Sure. Well, so you guys might have heard that uh, our Linux 249 codes were about to expire oh, last yeah. month, and so I'm talking with Danica last night. Or, I mean, the race car driver that yes, will yes, yes. remain anonymous. And uh, I hear some thumbling, thumbling. Like a back. rumbling Ooh, sound, yeah, like a that. thunder in yeah. the background. Sure. I, say, I say, Danica, what are you doing? Danica, what are you doing right now? Just stand by, Chris. And I find out she's broken into the GoDaddy <laughs> data centers. Now, tell, let me tell you, she had to use iris scanners. She oh had to gosh. defeat bodyguards, thumbprint Whoa, readers, good uh, laser fields. But she is truly uh, a data center ninja. She gets in That's there, crazy. and she stole more Linux 249 code so we can keep getting dot-coms for $2.49. And I said, Danica, I mean, I really appreciate your super crazy ninja skills breaking into data Holy. centers. I mean, look at the explosions, right? Yeah, there's explosions, Matt. Exactly. Goodness. And, you know, you you know got, you got another bag of those Linux 249 codes. She's got a whole other bag of those Linux 249 codes. And that's great. And I said, but look, can you go back in? Mm. Danica, can you go back in? Because kind of I, a mission I, impossible I, approach, right? I got a, co I got a code change idea. Mm. I, got a, I know this mm. is big. This is gonna this is gonna require your deepest penetration right. ever, Danica. But I think I can help you with that. I'll give you all the information you need. Okay. Here's what she did. Okay. She she breaks down into the data center from the roof oh by cable. Oh my goodness! We're talking like dangling and all bit. Gets down to the keyboard and recodes the GoDaddy.com website. Oh recodes my goodness! Recodes the GoDaddy.com website. So now it features the Express Pathway checkout when you're over <laughs> at GoDaddy.com. Nice. When you're getting to .com, you will complete that purchase within just a couple of clips. clicks. If you use the link in our show notes, Danica has set up Express Purchase Pathways Sweet. just for our viewers because she knows mm. you guys are tech heads. You don't need all of the extra no. hand-holding and You know what you want. You know, you what. know. Yeah. So just get in and get out. Get that .com for $2.49 when you use our code Linux249. And Danica set up that Express Pathway checkout if you use the link at the nice. top of our show notes. Nice. Yeah. She also wanted me to remind you that she still made that Go32 off to code work, too, if you want to take 32% off anything when you're over at GoDaddy.com. Go32 off to to save 32% or Linux 249 to get a dot-com. cents, And go use that express pathway while Danica still has that hacked into their source code. That's right. She's got it rerouted through their primary buffer system, so that way they can't detect it. And then she has their PHP admin system locked in a uh, continuous diagnostics loop. And then uh, if Goodness. you tweak it just right, uh, Mr. Scott will materialize. That's, that's yep. a neat trick. She's pretty powerful. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So thanks to GoDaddy.com <laughs> and thanks to a certain unnamed race car driver yes. for hooking us up with the special deals this week. That's awesome. I don't. I mean, I mean, we're really pulling out all the stops now to get That's this right. stuff. People got to take advantage of it while they can. There's cable cords and explosions and all Ooh, kinds Matt. of crazy things. And race car drivers. Oh, Matt, Bowie. Woo. All right, you ready for my Alrighty. Android pick this week? Oh yeah. You might have heard of it out there, folks. It's mm. free. It's called VLC Direct Pro. Oh yeah. And it allows you to take advantage of some of the cool features built into the VLC player on your desktop. Oh nice. In a remote. Mm -hmm. handy to use package nice. aka your android device Score. so uh vlc has a lot of different interfaces available to it okay. if you look if you bring up your vlc media player matt are you familiar with i am VLC? familiar with my yeah. vlc media player I, that was me delaying while i stopped That's right there no, I, I and i really appreciate my vlc media sure, player sure sure you know, it plays a lot of formats absolutely so if you go into plays vlc anything. and you hit view add interface mm -hmm. web Right. 
you are able to remotely control the VLC program. And for uh, you hacker kiddos out there, I've also included in the show notes a little command line. You just, oh. this is what I did to make it work for shizzles. And you oh, run right that. On. It starts up VLC. And then the web interface is running. Once the web interface is up and running, mm -hmm. there you. this is where VLC Direct comes in. And it gets real fancy here, Matt. Get there upon your app there. So VLC Direct will automatically scan your network mm -hmm. and detect the web interface running on your instance of VLC okay, as long so as it they're sees on the that same running. Line, okay, right? Sure. So you don't really have to do much beyond that. Okay. Once you've done that, and I'll, here, I'll show you. I'll, give yeah. you, I'll show you the screenshots. Once yeah. you've done that, yeah. VLC Direct gives you the option to take any of the media that's on your phone and send it to the VLC instance on your PC. Oh, that's handy. Yeah, so if you've just taken some photos or mm -hmm. if you just took a video um, and you want to show it to some folks, sure. yeah, if you got hooked up to your TV, mm -hmm. you could send it to your computer right away, sort of like AirPlay allows oh, or the Chromecast cool. allows. It also allows you to execute media that's uh, stored locally on the PC and control it from the phone. So I'll give you an example here. So that really cuts the, makes it more seamless between the devices. You don't. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's kind of handy. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter if it's on the phone or on yeah. the on the device. Now it's every now and then for me it's a little hit and miss. But sure. here I'll try. So I'm going to send yeah. a video that I started. I took out in the backyard. So the first time it comes up, you see I got an error message. Right. Uh, that just happens sometimes. I don't know why. But if I hit it like again here, let me hit it. Uh, there we go. Now there it works it this time. Okay. So there. So now I can play and stop this video here on my Android phone, wow. and I'm sending it to VLC. So now I'm playing it. Oh, see, it's buffering yep. a little bit because probably my wireless. Sure, we got a lot going on. Yeah. So it, there's. So I'm sending that. Well, the wireless of my bedroom too. Oh yeah, yeah. But so here I can send that now. If I send like a. Oh, this is the other trick too. Mm -hmm. Is if you're on a weak wireless signal, you just send like a lower a lower resolution video. Like oh, uh, so you can accommodate if you've got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. You know, like yeah. here's a three megabyte video. This will probably play just fine. Okay. Wait for it and go. Wait for it. See though, so now it starts. Oh, oh there it is. And it actually, you can see down in the VLC bar, right when I start it, mm -hmm. there'll be a little indication that it's buffering, and you can see right. the VLC is actually trying to buffer the. There it's, it goes. it's doing a pretty good job though. You know. Yeah. I Consider. Mean, I mean, considering I've how much got, we got have, have going on. It's, well, I only have two bars of Wi-Fi out here because ah, it's up sure. in the other end of my house, sure. but. When you have a little bit better signal to work a little better, it's going to be kind of hit and miss because, like, those are HD videos I'm sending. Mm -hmm. So, okay. you know. That's pretty, yeah. But, that's okay, so now if I go over to uh, the computer icon here, mm -hmm. I can now browse uh, the files that are on my computer. I can even browse. Oh, that's cool. Check this out. Check this out. This uh -huh. is crazy. So I have, um, I have right here my NFS share added to VLC. Ooh. So now on my, I can start video files. So here I will start Back to the Future. That's oh, on that's my NFS cool. server. <laughs> Uh, from my phone. Oh, that's nice. And I'm not streaming it from my phone. I can now turn my phone off. I can put right. it away. It'll keep, it'll keep playing just fine because it's now playing inside oh, VLC. Man. So there's no data. If I execute right. a file that's on the NFS share or on the computer, VLC takes care of that connection. Oh, here's the nice phone's no longer involved. You. Hotel room, on a business trip, laptops open across the room. You're tired. You don't want to get up. You grab your phone. You do everything you need to do from VLC remotely. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. I like it. Yep. So there you go. Good so use now. Case. Uh, so there's, so there is, so back to the future. Yeah, back to the future. Good stuff. Uh, so that's VLC Direct Pro. It does all kinds of neat things. You can send mm -hmm. photos. Um, you can send. Uh, it it can detect all the music on mm -hmm. your phone, and you can send music tracks. So it breaks it all out into videos, music, and local computer st stuff. So it's really nice. It's got cool Plex-like capabilities, but I like the fact that it really is less about where the media is stored. Where Plex, it does kind of matter where the media is stored. So that's that's kind of cool. Yeah. So here, I'm going to try sending just a photo. See if I can do just a still. See if it'll let me. It kind of hit and miss sometimes. You'll find that you'll find that at least in my experimentation, sometimes you just have to. There it goes. So it took oh, me yeah. a couple of times to send that. Right. But <laughs> but every now and then, like if you tap it a couple of times, it'll it'll show That's up on cool. the screen. That's cool. Yeah. So it's VLC. You can also get a pro version, and then it removes all the advertising right. that's in here. There's only one ad that I is really along yeah. the top there. And so yeah, bad. for that, what the heck? Yeah. Right. I mean, shoot. Shoot, man. Shoot. So go check Shoot. out uh, VLC Direct Pro. We will have nice. it in the show notes. And it's essentially just a really nice way to send media from your device, either it be um, pictures, music, mm -hmm. or videos, mm -hmm. to your desktop. And if you have a good Wi-Fi signal, you can do HD. If you have a weaker Wi-Fi mm -hmm. signal, you probably need to stay to SD like I was having to do out here in the garage. But either way, you have playability options, and that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, uh, uh, now, it. it's funny is it doesn't do any local playback. It's VLC, ah. but uh, not as we know it, Matt. Not right. as we know it. Okay. All That's right. Still pretty cool. Moving on to the Linux desktop pick Jeez. for this week. You're going to have to dig a little bit to find this one for your distribution of choice. I've linked to a couple. I couldn't find one for OpenSUSE or yeah. Fedora, but I got you Arch users and Ubuntu users covered. It's you called, know it's going to be there for the Arch. I, 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 yeah, right? <laughs> you just know, yeah. It's called uh, MKV Extractor GUI. And yep. there's several different things that are called MKV Extractor. You want MKV Extractor GUI. And okay. what this does is, uh, so the MKV file 
it's a widely used video container format that's uh, open, mm -hmm. and it allows for multiple things inside an MKV file. So when you have an MKV file, you can have a video track in there. You could have multiple audio all tracks, right. you know, sometimes English. They get the subtitles too, doesn't it? Oh, tons yeah. of sub. You can yeah. have all kinds of stuff in there. So it's a great container. I mean, it's yeah, it all. is very powerful. And uh, and here is uh, MK Viewer, MK Extractor GUI. Now, the problem mm -hmm. is every now and then you get one of them MKV files that's got way more, uh, it's got all these subtitles in there, or yeah. it's got the wrong default language right. selected. Oh, yes, every right? time. Yeah. So if I go in here, and so we'll, we'll be talking about these later, but these are, mm -hmm. uh, these are um, Blu-rays that I have ripped recently, okay? Oh, okay. Yeah, from the, uh, from, we showed you. Right. Yeah. So when I open these up, you can see in here, there is, uh, here's all the chapter information. Mm -hmm. Here's my subtitle track. Here's my audio track. Now, I can see in here, because the way I've ripped these, oh, right. this is an English audio track. But if it was... Um, a German audio track, it would say German right there. That's so it, handy. So you're not, it's no longer a guessing game. Right. You know? And then you just, you could just extract that um, oh, and you wow. can say, okay, I want this and I want this and I want That's this. Cool. I can, you can also say convert uh, the uh, Dolby uh, digital sound to AC3, which will play Ooh. back on, on more devices. Right. And then when you execute it, it will now, it won't re encode the file, it will just rewrap those files in a new MKV. It doesn't degrade the quality at all. It doesn't, nice. You don't have to wait for video to re-encode. So you can remove languages from MKV files that you don't speak. So it's just a new container. It's not new code. Okay. Right. right. Totally. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 not, it's, not new, it's not new video encoding. It's just a new container. Good um, stuff. And, and, you know, if you've got like an MKV file where the default uh, has the subtitles on and you yeah. don't need subtitles in that video... You open up M MKV Extractor GUI, and you can pull them right out. What a great way to back up your media. I mean, Yeah, this is also a way, if you wanted to create an MKV file, and you sure. wanted to store maybe uh, something with that file, video file, you could use MK MKV Extractor GUI to do that. Oh, totally. Like, if you wanted to do maybe uh, subtitles for a, fa a family movie or something like that, that'd be kind of cool. Yep, yep. So I have, uh, yeah. I have links to uh, the AUR version, and um, let's see, I also have links to a... Uh, I think I had. Do I have a link? Yeah, uh, to a PPA yep. for. Uh, oh, uh, nice. Ubuntu. So yeah, you got Ubuntu and Arch covered. Those yeah. are the two biggest. I, I searched around in the OpenSUSE build service and yeah. I didn't see anything. I, for I've it. run into that with a few apps. It's kind of what pushed me back over to going another direction. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. It's so. you know it's so cool because uh, it's 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 just without having to retouch the files means that like you could have a 25 gigabyte MKV file and you could extract stuff out and you're not spending 12 hours for it to re-encode. You're not handbreaking it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, if you've used it, you understand. It's and like, you're not oh, hurting the quality either. No, really nice. no, no, yeah. no. Yeah. Nice hey, and fast. Hey, Matt, before we run, I want to remind Yeesh. folks that they can participate and contribute to the show. They can send us uh, pics for the yeah. Runs Linux for the desktop or Android pic. Love. Love, love to get some desktop picks that you guys feel like we haven't mentioned that we should totally. have. Like Conky was a great oh, example. Yeah. Um, great. And so send in your suggestions. One great way to do that is to submit them to our subreddit, linuxactionshow.reddit.com. I'd, I'd go so far as to say that's our number one way to get a yeah. hold of us. That's really yeah, good. I'm always in there. Even if I'm not responding to every thread sure. because that gets um, unobtainable, I am at least reading them. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Same here. Yeah, sometimes I'll uh, chime in. Sometimes yeah. I'll troll yeah. back. Yeah, yeah sometimes it's like, yeah, you know, you know, Chris doesn't respond very often. I'm like, I try to respond several times a day. I, I apologize. Exactly. It's you know, but we are in there and we're taking the feedback very seriously. Totally. We we, uh, we watch that not just for like the obvious things like what people vote on, but I, yeah. I monitor trends mm -hmm. and I, I notice I notice a lot of uh, subtle hints that help influence the show that I don't even think you guys realize. LinuxActionShow.reddit.com. It's funny we've got people who are trolling in there that don't even watch the show now because it's such a great subreddit. That's awesome. I yeah. love that. Hey, that works. So yeah. go check that out and you can help make the show even better. Good stuff. All right, Matt. Let's do the news. Hey, it's the news, and this episode's brought to you by... Ting.com. Ting is mobile that makes sense, Matt. Let me tell you a little bit about Ting if I could, sir. Tell me about Ting. All right, I'm going to tell right. you about Ting. Ting's been my mobile service since the beginning of the year. Hallelujah. Let you me don't tell you say. What. Hallelujah. Let Hallelujah. me tell you what. Now, how many people come on the air and say, I love my mobile company? That, I love my phone uh, all company. the time, they're always coming and saying, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me since I went to the dentist. I, I, <laughs> I think, right? I mean, I that's kind of how they feel. I think you have it backwards. I, yeah, have no, I, I think you have it backwards. You, they they love their. I mean, no, I know they love Ting, but don't. They, but they're not going to love their Ting. other. Yeah, Everybody but loves. But they're not going to love their other mobile phones. No, how no, could they? Because no. they are not anywhere no, near no, as no, awesome no. as Ting. Let me tell yeah. you a little bit about Ting. No contracts, no early termination yeah. fees, no bundling of ride along services. None of that nonsense. You just pay for what you use mm -hmm. and bundling of like. Oh, I don't know. Let's say something like tethering hotspot. 
That's not some add-on charge. That's not some extra package you got to sign up for. You don't got to be a family share plan. Mm -mm. No fancy terminology. Just get her done. You just turn it on and use it. That's what I love about Ting. Go to last.ting.com. Save $25 on the best mobile service that's out there. Go check out the way their rates work. This is going to blow your mind right here. They break your rates up by minutes, text messages, and megabytes, and they just bill you at the the end of the month for whatever bucket you fill into. Mm -hmm. You can plug in, kind of get an idea what you're going to want. Let's say maybe you don't use the phone a lot. So you get 500 minutes. Maybe you text message a lot. So we'll pop that up to 2,000 messages, and we'll give you 3,000 megabytes of data usage. Mm-hmm. You got one phone on there. There you go. With built-in hotspot tethering, three gigabytes, 83 bucks a month. That's way cheaper than you're going to get on anything else out there. You can go over to ting.com and check out their savings calculator. Plug in your current bill and just compare. You'll see what I'm talking about. Oh, it, yeah. is, it is mind-numbing. The difference in price you'll pay, you'll see how you're being taken advantage of today and how Ting makes that difference. Oh, it's a stupid, crazy difference. It'll just blow your mind when you see the data. And I'll give you another thing I like that Ting's just helping you along the way. Here's my Ting uh, account panel here. Oh, And yes. I can go into alerts, and I can define a new alert in my control panel. Look at this. Look how easy oh, this is. So, so when I say when my account exceeds 200 minutes or whatever I want, right. you know, I could say, or if I didn't want minutes, I could say megabytes or maybe messages, well, right? it's all right there. You're not having to hunt and peck for, you know, your options and your so settings. You I can find a, it super I say simple. if I get more than 100 messages, yeah. I mean, holy moly, right. if I get more than 100 messages, send me an email. Let yeah, me no know, kidding. you know, just say, hey, buddy, by the way, you're yeah. using a lot. Also, they'll notify you via push message if you have Ooh. the optional Ting app. That's the other thing I like I a lot. like that. They yeah. let you manage your Ting service via a mobile app. I'm going to install this sucker right now. Why I'm don't kidding. I have this? I know. It's like I had it on my email, uh, note, too. I got to put it you on know, my... You may not Jeez. see the email, but you're going to see the push. Oh, you're going to see the... Well, it's also like you're on the go. Maybe you have some yeah. friends with you. You're like, hey, I could turn on tethering. Let me just totally. check my usage real quick. And it's no Boom. big deal because you only pay for what you use. You don't have to worry about getting into some sort of crazy rate game yeah. where they're going to charge you a ton. Straight on top forward. of that, if you have any questions, if you get stuck along the way, mm-hmm. if maybe you need a little help with your Ting service, not only do they have extremely active forms mm-hmm. and some really good help online, you can also call them at 1-855-TING-FTW between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern and a real live, actual human being empowered to solve your problem answers the phone. No robots. Some kind of crazy magic that. I know. It's like people, no automated nonsense, no robots, human beings. That's a good thing. I also absolutely love the fact that uh, the way their rate plans work out means that I can have multiple phones on my plan. I only pay a flat $6 a month per phone, so I've got several phones. And I don't have a guilt trip if one phone sits a little unused that month because I didn't need to test anything on it. No big deal. Ting's awesome rate plan means I'm not sitting there paying for something that I'm not using. Go to last.ting. Save $25 off your first month or $25 off your first device. Love Ting. Go check them out. And thanks to Ting for sponsoring. The Linux Action Show. Big thanks to those guys. Good Boom. stuff. All Ooh. right, Matt. All right. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Mailpile. Mailpile. Kind of sounds, cool name. Kind of sounds like, uh, kind of sounds like something Reminds else, me of MailSack. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it kind of does. does, you know? Mailpile. I love talking about MailSacks. Yeah, absolutely. So, they are launching. Mailpile has actually been around. I, would, I checked their GitHub page out. Yeah. Uh, from what I could tell, they've actually maybe been around for as long as two years. Wow. They've decided recently they want to refactor their code. They want to make it look a lot better. They want to bring sure. some new people online. And... Honestly, they kind of just make no bones about it. All the revelations around Prism and the NSA has sort of made them refocus and sort of want to double down on the Good project. Good for them for, you know, embracing that and yeah. making that work. So MailPile is, uh, the, the goal is to take email back, they say, a modern, fast webmail client with uh, user-friendly encryption and privacy features. It'll be 100% open source. I want to play a little bit of their video and then we're going to talk about it. I'm excited because this could be a premier open source yeah. mail platform. So let's take a listen. All right. The free software world really needs better webmail. We need something that can compete with Gmail, compete with Hotmail, and compete with all the other cloud providers, not just on freedom, but on features as well. My name is Jarni, and I'm an Icelandic free software developer. For the past two years, MailPile has been my hobby, a side project I work on in my spare time. This spring, I decided I wanted to make it my full-time job. I wanted to put together a team and try and make something really cool. To make this happen, I've assembled a team of three. Myself, Brendan Novak, and Shmauda McCarthy. Email is basically one of the things that runs our planet, but everybody's doing it insecurely. When you send an email, what you're doing is you're really sending something that functions more like a postcard than a letter in the sense that anybody who sees it on its way from 
or its origin to its destination, can read its entire contents. Even worse than that, anybody who wants to could write a new postcard and claim that it comes from you. We've so one of the things that uh, we've talked a lot about is uh, one of the obstacles that uh, solutions like this face are the ease of use of encryption. And one of right. the things that MailPile is are targeting is built-in uh, open PGP, sort of from the very get-go, that's very easy to use, sort of automatically sets up, everybody uses it, and it's going to be an open source package that relies on standard open source uh, tools and servers that you can deploy on a cloud-hosted solution, or you could deploy on your own server. I like that. I like the level of control they're giving folks, and I like the fact that they're addressing it in a way that really matters to people, especially these days. Now, they got a really good... Now, this is all mock-up at this point, because sure. they're, re they're reworking the UI right now, but they've got a really nice web UI. Now, it's all going to be web-based. Now, I don't know if eventually they plan to have a, a you know like an IMAP interface, but right. it's initially... It gives them some flexibility to get out the door on multiple platforms fast. Exactly, and they, and they really are targeting killing Gmail in a big way, because yeah. one, of the, one of the things that they realize is the appeal of these web UIs is that Webmail is it's very easy to get up and running. It's very mm -hmm. fast. You know, you don't have to worry about installing software, which right. a lot of users struggle Running with. Running on anything. Yeah. So a uh, mail pile is uh, it's reaching. Uh, it's on Indiegogo right now. It's at thirteen thousand dollars in funding. They've wow. got a goal of a hundred thousand dollars. Got some good thirty-eight days left. They, yeah. you know, hopefully. I see, and I think this is what we saw missing with the uh, mail client that you were excited about. Is that both great Gary. mail clients, but yeah, with Gary, that we actually see a very definitive, here's why you really are bent on throwing some money at it, uh, because it's addressing a need. Right, you're right. I mean, now when you look at this, you can kind of see, okay, Gary was, what, what maybe Gary had missed the mark on was, it wasn't really solving any existing right. email problem. Gorgeous but, client, great, right. great tools, really right. responsive but, compared to Thunderbird, but it just wasn't really... Yeah. Right. Loud enough, I guess. Right. Whereas, good. like, when you look at the two, like, Thunderbird, I actually ended up going back to because of its yeah. uh, GPG encryption support or when you get add ons. Yeah. It's so, clunky, but it works. When you have yeah. something like this, though, that offers good UI, that mm -hmm. offers um, better mobile experience, That's and right. it also offers built in support for encryption, maybe mm -hmm. those are enough features to sort of tip it over. But I think possibly. You know, we're sitting here and it's only at 13,000. And there's, and they're, and, and yeah, and I think they're going to really have to get some press attention for this to work. Uh, hopefully, you know, us mentioning it will help. But I think just in general, if this is something that's important to you, Throw some money their way. Yeah, and I mean, I think they're going to continue on depending on how much funding they get. But the more funding they get, the further the project gets. Yeah. Uh, they're also accepting Bitcoin donations. So That'll help. Go. Yeah, that that's will help. Good. And it's uh, on target. I'm I'm excited to see where it goes. Uh, I linked to a write up on it over at ghacks.net. Mm -hmm. They sort of take the uh, you know going against Google uh, approach on it. So if that's Smart. kind of your thing, that's an interesting article to read as well. That's yeah, good PR spin. I mean, it's the, way, it's the way I would take it if I was them. Encryption comes in another form as well. The developers will add support for open PGP signatures and encryption to the mm -hmm. core of MailPile so that it can be used intuitively and without all the hassles usually involved in setting this up properly. Mm. Nice. I think. I like that goal a Good lot. Good problem-solving stuff, yeah. I feel like um, there has been some really awesome open-source encryption. Yes. That it can solve a lot of problems for a lot of folks, but there's just people are not using it because of whatever reason, because right. it's not set up for them, I exactly. guess. Exactly. That and maybe, they, well, it's not, it's not it's, I'm not thinking of it. It's probably not a big deal, meh, you know. But if they have something that's all done for them, then it, you know, the transition becomes a lot easier. And I think over time, more and more people are going to become interested in this particular topic is mm -hmm. this sort of continuous state of surveillance sort of sets in and people sure. realize the long-term negative aspects yeah. of that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Ubuntu right Edge, a little Ubuntu Edge oh, catch-up yeah. before uh, we move on. Uh, so uh, this is an interesting story this week. LastPass, I'm a huge LastPass yeah. fan, announced that they will hand out premium plans to those who get an Ubuntu Edge phone oh, if cool. they reach their funding. That's kind of a That's nice awesome. little... And I guess that also then shows that they'll have a LastPass app. That's very cool and yeah. very helpful. Yeah. Uh, so let's go see how the Ubuntu Edge uh, phone yeah, is doing. See what their, uh, how, how close they are to their goals. Uh, the funding has kind of definitely stalled a little bit. Uh, I think as, as of we're recording this episode, they're about 25-ish oh, yeah. percent, $8.1 yeah. million dollars out of I, a goal yeah, of 32. And, and, you know, I honestly feel like that they're going to need that push at the end. I don't know who from or how it's going to work. But, yeah, this has been know. an interesting debate watching this online this week. Mm -hmm. So a lot of folks are like, well... Campaigns are they have big kick ups in the beginning, then they lull, and they have big kick ups again. And other folks are like, no, no, they need to have a sustained rate of funding regardless, or they're not going to yeah. make it. Sustained rate of funding doesn't exist except for maybe games. I, that's the only time I've ever seen that actually happen. Games and uh, maybe movies, things like that, things that are really uh, emotional. But uh, yeah, with something like this, I, I, I'm surprised. You know, I thought we did a decent job debunking this meme last week, but the heart, yeah. the uh, HW Killer, and a few other folks in the chat room are still saying. Well, if it doesn't make it, Mark will fund it. But 
I not necessarily. Argue, yeah, I argue that's not the case. First of all, you got to remember that this funding is sort of breaking out around seven hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars per phone. All right. When you're when you're actually manufacturing less devices, that that's that might be too low. And they might actually not be charging enough, and then Mark's got to cover that difference. It's practically subsidized as it is, and on top of the fact that the, he's using this as a tool, uh, uh, basically a proof of concept to the companies he's pitching, um, which he has had interest from them, but they do need to see this come to fruition because mm -hmm. this is an indicator as whether or not people will buy it and whether or not these companies want yeah. to throw back into it. So if he funds it, he kind of shoots himself in the foot, really. Right, yeah, because then, then he's not getting that, that valuable yeah. signal, as he likes to say. Yeah. And uh, Jono was going to join us this week, but his flight was delayed. Yep. So we'll probably pick this up next week, which will be probably even more relevant the conversations yeah. we're going to have at that point because it's going to be even closer. Sure. Uh, curious to see where this goes and what it means if it doesn't make it. Yeah. And it's really going to be something if they do pull it off. It's, at this point, it's really going to be something. It's going to be a big story. Uh, I so. hope they do. You know, just I, I think it would be healthy to have a little something else on the market. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, Matt, well, brace nope. yourself nope. because it's time... <laughs> That's right, Matt. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's the whale. No, I'm sorry. The X11 Death Watch. I was going to say the whale and triumph. <laughs> it's the, it's the mirror. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, just, it's the monkey suit Death Watch. That's what I'm hoping. Uh, no, no. So uh, that is our new jingle. Thanks yep. to the chat room for uh, the uh, X11 Death Watch section of the news. Every now and then when big things happen on the move to X11 or away from X11, mm -hmm. we'll do a little segment on nice. it. So we're going to start. Uh, with our first story, when it comes to the move away from X11, Fedora has announced that they'll be porting GNOME to Wayland. Boy, oh boy. So now we got somebody uh, who yeah. says, you know what, guys? We're going to take on the hard work. We're going to do the big task. That's pretty heavy stuff. We're going to buckle down. So here it is. I love this summary for this on the uh, Fedora wiki. Hmm. Port the GNOME desktop to Wayland. It's clean and simple that's to the, the point. Summary, right? That's the entire summary. But that's a big job. Don't let the summary fool you. <laughs> right, exactly. Holy cow. Uh, they have a targeted... You ready for this? Oh. Fedora 21. Wow. That's not too far no, away. Oh, it's not. No. Really? Uh, Fedora stays at the forefront of Linux development by adopting the next generation display server technology after X. Wow. Aiming for Fedora 21 with this transition gives us mm -hmm. the chance to influence many aspects of the Wayland based user space before they're set in stone. Yeah, good time to get started, I guess, right? And that's a, it's an interesting logic where the Fedora is like, we benefit by being the people that take this on because then we get to set the, uh, right. the tone. Totally. Yeah. Uh, all right, moving right along on the move away from X11, Pharonix ran a story this week about a new game. Well, not a new game, but a game that's been pointed to Wayland slash Weston. Uh, you well, might have heard of yeah, it before. Yeah. It's called Neverball. I have. Neverball, uh, Never Put Games has, uh, has ported the uh, Neverball game over to Wayland and Weston, as mm -hmm. per this tweet. How about that, Matt? So we've that's got our first... That's crazy. I, I mean, think, so, right? I mean, this is our first... These, that is the first game that I can think of. I mean, so that's, that's a big deal. I mean, it may, it's, not, it's not so much which game it is. It's the fact that games and, <laughs> yeah, it's you know. Definitely not so much which game. But no, no, no. Cool. But it's very, very important. It's the first step. Dun, dun, dun. And moving right along as we continue on the uh, X11 ride, yeah. uh, Sailfish has announced they're beginning work on moving Sailfish OS uh, uh -huh. over to QT5 Whoa. and QT Quick 2 and Wayland. Oh, no. Dun, 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 dun. Good grief. Yeah. It's like all at once, too. So we have that. And then... Which I'm very excited about as a former IT support guy because this is one of the yes. things that I was concerned about. Uh, the Real VNC project has announced plans for remote desktop support on Wayland. About time, good and, stuff. And this yeah. is uh, this is this is worth noting just because as of right now, at least according to the Canonical developers, uh, mm -hmm. there's no plans for a remote desktop solution for Mir. So this might help address that in the future. Well, this is for Wayland. Yeah, but, but yeah, you're right. Maybe you know, what they I, solve I, here. You know, I don't think I'm, and I'm still on the fence with that. I think. I think we will see some Wayland support in Ubuntu at some point. I think it's going to have to happen. Um, Wouldn't we'll that be interesting? I th not right away, but I think hmm. it will. At the moment, there's no VNC support for Wayland, yeah. but there is an RDP backend for use with Microsoft's oh. remote desktop protocol. Wow. wow. Okay. Wow. Wow. Hopefully, real VNC's Wayland efforts will come to fruition the next Way in the next Wayland Weston update. Wouldn't that be interesting That's if it was wild. actually integrated in the very back end? That you, would be bizarre. You could just yeah. turn it on and you had remote access right? at that level. Uh, all right, so there you go. Um, I uh, that was that was the. Uh, I, I, let's see. Let's play it again. Let's play it again. Dun, Ready, dun, Matt? Dun. Yeah. Nice. X11 Death Watch. 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 So that's dramatic. That's crazy. That's so. How about that? So we got links to all that stuff. That was yeah. like. I just feel like we just busted through like four or totally. five really big uh, Wayland stories. 
it's coming, Matt. It's coming sooner than later. Pretty soon, I think we'll be having a segment where we're sitting down here and running one of our favorite desktops on. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah, that will Good be. Good stuff. All right, Matt. That's all the news for this week. One of the things that's plagued Linux users for a long time is managing their Blu-ray collection under mm -hmm. Linux. This is something that I just wanted to finally just solve and move on because as my right. kids have gotten older, protecting my Blu-ray collection has gotten more and more important. And my regular DVDs as well. This would actually work for DVDs too. Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about the solution that I arrived and, uh, and really how easy it is actually to get going and set up once you've just got all the parts in place. Nice. But first, Matt, nice. I want to thank our segment sponsor, System76. Love System these guys. System76, makers of the finest machines designed to run Linux from the very beginning. And let me tell you, as a Bonobo Extreme owner, mm -hmm. every day I am so thankful that I have this laptop. It is so. It has become, as I've had a lot of hardware failures lately, it has become my rock. Everything <laughs> I, every, I move more and more on. Everything just crashing and burning around it, you, it but really, you know this is going to be here for you. It is my yeah. island of tranquility. Yeah. And I honestly, too, I was reading through some people who have really struggled with video drivers and problems like that under Arch. I think a big, pro a big part of the success that I've had running Arch Linux has been that the Bonobo is such a great machine for Linux in general. Mm -hmm. right. I really have not had challenges with any of that exactly. kind of stuff. So there's all kinds of benefits, not just when you're running Ubuntu, but for you Ubuntu users, you really get a complete package. Now, That's we right. talk about all the time, they have this brand new Ultrabook. And I see these threads online. People are like, oh, what Ultrabook would be the best one to buy and then install? All the time. What should I, what should I, what, hey, what Ultrabook should I buy and install Linux on? Are you kidding me? This I want to make sure it has a Windows sticker on it so then I can bitch and complain later when it doesn't work as thought. I mean, this I, is yeah. built to run Linux. Go check out the new Ultra yeah. Pro portable laptop from System76. Man, what a sweet rig. Yep. But if you need a desktop, I, I really think the, uh, the secret to the uh, performance price ratio right here is the Rattel Performance. This little box, I've seen this mach it's machine. It's stuck in there, didn't it? It's, it's kind of nice. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quiet. It's got a lot of power. It's got a lot of options. You can do some ooh. nice integrated GPU. You can do an extended yeah. uh, onboard GPU. I really think this is a great machine, and it's a perfect example of the fit and finish of System76 mm -hmm. boxes and uh, why I think they're just fantastic. Good case size. I love the little pedestals. You know, it's very living room friendly, too. It'd be a nice little media box. It would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. it'd actually work really good in the studio, too, I think. Yeah, I was just looking at it. I was thinking, you know, that actually is quite aesthetic. Right. You know, if we knew some company that maybe had, like, a spare one of these, <sighs> totally. and they wanted to send it for me, I could, I could use that. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Just saying. Anyways, <laughs> uh, go check out uh, System76.com. These yep. guys build machines that are born to run mm -hmm. Linux, and they build complete solutions from end to end and they support them for years. So really, right. as a Linux user, the exact kind of thing we want to see. We want to see companies like this. They're good, genuine companies making a great product built around Linux. Right. Love System76. Go get yourself something real nice and tell them the Linux Action Show hey, sent you. Got a 2008 laptop I got from them. I still get support on it. I, I have worked for companies that are no longer in existence that bought me System76 hardware yeah. that I have used from those, yep. since, since that day, I mean, these companies, like, they got this stuff for me, like, I, I want to say it was, like, maybe 2008, 2007, yeah, right, right. and it is still functioning. I know, isn't that crazy? It it's is. like, what? Like, the company is no longer around, but the hardware is still a champ, and it is yep. un, it's unbeatable. I absolutely love it. So go check out System76, you guys. Good stuff. All right, Matt. So, okay. I, I wanted to come up with a way to back up uh, Blu-rays with some flexibility. First right. of all, I am a quality freak. I encode video for a living. Right? That's, and I mean, you're very selective as to how your video looks. It's, I am very you particular, know, and I know I know way. how it can look, and I know right. I know like where when it looks bad, and I know yep. what to look for. Mm -hmm. And so I like when I'm watching a movie. The problem is, and this is this is kind of an OCD thing, I guess, is when I'm watching a movie. If I see bad encoding, it actually takes me out of the movie because I realize, oh man, that's encoded wrong. And, and you've totally lost your thought. It's distracting. Yep. It yep. is so. I have actually just taken to encoding all of my own video myself. That way, I make sure it's done right and it meets the mind quality standards. And I wanted to be able to do this on my laptop. I wanted to be able mm -hmm. to do it on a desktop. Sure. I need to be able to move around because I've got a lot of different machines that do different jobs at different right. times. So I decided instead of going with anything internal, I went with this Lacie uh. Blu-ray USB 3.0. Oh, then that's an important differentiator. Yeah, and it's yeah. bus power too. Now it is one of these units that's got the two USB adapters on it, so you got to plug one for the data and one for the power. Oh, okay. But that's okay. But that's I mean, fine if you're getting a good quality, non stuttery experience. You that's can worthwhile. also get a power adapter if you want. If you wanted to, but who cares, right? I mean, yeah. And this thing has worked. And I was a little, I was a little nervous about going USB for this. Right, right. But, well, I, but I've had good experiences with other. Optical yeah, yeah. I like mean, that, so. you know, for right for DVDs and CD-ROMs, yeah. it's been fine. So I thought, sure. all right, I'll give it a try with USB 3.0 on Blu-ray. Totally been flawless. Works just fine on nice. my Bonobo here. 
um, which has a USB 3.0 port. Yeah. And then and then the other thing about this is I can take it to other rigs. So I have a yeah, machine that's yeah, in the yeah. studio here that when I'm not that's doing That's where the Skype, external option really comes yeah. in handy. It's yeah. like you can run on whatever you want. So um, I went that way. You could totally, this would totally work with internal as well. So I'll plug it in here. And I want it, the reason why I want to show you this, because I think an important part to making this work really well under Linux mm -hmm. Is it, I have follow I follow a specific order of execution. Sure. And I, when I stick to this order of execution, I generally don't have any problems. When I okay. don't follow this order of execution, sometimes a disk doesn't get read right. You're gonna have a bad time. Yeah, you could just potentially have a bad time. Mm -hmm. So uh, first thing I do obviously is I hook up the uh, external drive. Okay. Get all that plugged in. Yeah, and then I once I have the external drive launched, You're then check and see if it's installed. I should be. Yeah, you could always de yeah definitely yeah. worth checking. But then once I have it, yeah. uh, one quick way you can find out if it, if your system sees it is oh yeah, uh, yeah launch the program that I this is this is the secret sauce right mm -hmm. here. It's called Make MKV. It's been out for Linux for a little while. Mm -hmm. It is a proprietary program. You can try it for free for thirty days, okay. and it handles the Blu-ray decryption, the I AACS, and the BD Plus decryption. I yeah. love that it does it all for you. Remember back in the day, just to get all that to happen, oh, yeah. it was like a, oh, you know, forget oh. it. Go to find the key. You know? No, it was, it's almost, <laughs> it's just, and the problem is on Blu-ray is that they have a system where they can update that key. Nice. So it's, it's That's not. That's handy. Well, no, what I mean is the Blu-ray encryption can be oh. updated. So if you, if you are manually circumventing the encryption, mm -hmm. within several, maybe like six months, Within about six oh, months, the I see what you're saying. The My Blu-ray, okay. yeah, the encryption on the Blu-ray changes, right? I understand. So okay. Make MKV will then issue an update to that accommodates oh. for that new encryption standard. That's, that's important. Yeah, that's, that's kind that, of that's very important actually. Okay, that's kind of nice. So you can go over to Make hmm. MKV. Um, uh, it's fifty bucks if you buy it. You can try it for thirty days for free. I bought it. Yeah. And is what it? it what it does is it takes the Blu-ray and it rips the Blu-ray, decrypts it and puts it into an unencumbered MKV file. It doesn't encode oh. it. It is full size. So I'll show you kind of how that works. So once you have your your Blu-ray drive in your system, you have it attached. Mm -hmm. You'll see in Make MKV, you'll see all it'll detract it'll detect all the drives on my system. Right. So I could rip a DVD or I could rip a Blu-ray. So I have the Blu-ray drive detected, and you'll and one, there's little it gives you little indicators that tells you its status. Like right now in the messages it says no disk inserted. Mm -hmm. exactly. If you have a disk in there and you see that, then you know you got a problem. Sure. You're gonna have a bad time. So then you take you take out your disk. And I do. The, I put the disk in there when I have make MKV running. I think this is an important part. I have found that if I put the disk in and then launch make MKV, mm -hmm. I don't know why. Sometimes it doesn't. My have subsequent it. rips don't work as well, or it doesn't oh. see all the tracks. I don't know what it is Weird. about that. But so you put it in there. You see it. You see it. Oh, that's a nice little animation. Yeah. And so it make MKV all along the way mm. should be giving you signals. It should detect when your drive bay is open, mm -hmm. and then it should spin the drive. And then when it's done spinning, it should detect if it's a Blu-ray or a DVD. Now. You got to keep in mind where you're going to back these things up to. Okay? Right, you need a destination. Sure. Um, let's see. I've already, uh, I've already, I've already ripped uh, the uh, Back to the Future. Um, okay. So I will go. I'll go. Uh, so I'll just give you an example here. If I go look on my, I, I rip everything to my NFS share, NFS share because it's so large. Right. So Back to the Future ripped is 23 gigabytes. Oh wow! Okay. So you need to have somewhere you're going to be able to store 23 gigabytes because this is mm -hmm. a Blu-ray and it rips the full quality track from the Blu-ray disc. And it's I think not that's encoded. an important differentiator to other applications is that you're not re-encoding squat. You're literally right. dropping this in a container that your computer can work yeah. with. So. And you see now Make MKV has a little Blu-ray symbol oh, on the disc nice. in the drive. I love that animation. It just yeah. really helps you to kind of visualize what's going on without so wondering. Once it's, and if it, if it was a DVD, it would have a DVD image in there. Right. Sure. So once it's detected it, you click on that, and now Make MKV will scan all of the tracks mm -hmm. on the disc. If it's um, a TV series, like I have uh, Star Trek here, oh, and that's so cool. Star, uh, Star Trek series will have several titles on the disc. Each right. title is one of the episodes. So you uh, you kind of have to. It's a little tricky under Linux, but you see when I'm looking at these titles, you see how this one's 29 gigabytes. This title one here. Is oh yes, gigs. right. And it's not. And so you have titles and chapters. And right. So that gets okay. And so these titles, one gigabyte, two hundred megabytes, uh, three yeah. gigabytes. They these are all likely like special features sure. or like title animations. And I don't need those, so I'll just uncheck those. Now you could back those up as well if you wanted to, right? Well, well another thing I'm noticing too is that if it doesn't have the word chapters or chapter in there somewhere, it's probably just fluff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. And that's kind of a fast way of doing. So then you choose where you want it to rip to. Make sure that's mm -hmm. the spot that you have a lot of storage. Right. And you give it the name, and then you click this Make MKV file, mm -hmm. and it'll take about you know in my setup here it it took about 45 minutes to copy off. Pretty um, reasonable. That's really actually yeah. quite coming reasonable. off optical. That's actually amazing. And now, if if this was an, if this was a TV series on here, like the Star Trek one, 
you would have multiple titles. Right. Because you have multiple episodes on one disc. Since this is a movie, there's really only one title that I want to back up. I see. Okay. All right. So you, then I would just click make MKV and it would start the process. And I'd show it to you, but I've already done that and we sure. don't have 50 minutes. To oh, no, no. Just sitting here through that. Be a little painful. So as I mentioned earlier, once the file has been ripped, uh, you have this MKV file that is huge, huge. And if it's a, DV, if it's a DVD, it's going to be about four gigs or so. Mm-hmm. And I, you could, you could call it, you could call it good at this point. It'll actually play. Oh, you just VLC it. At oh yeah, point, VLC right? will sure. play a lot. Uh, Plex will play it. All right. Oh, a lot yeah. of things will play it at this okay. point. Okay. Um, okay. Cool. And uh, there's there's different programs you can you can analyze this with. We've uh, like we've like we talked about earlier. You could open this up in MKV Extractor, right. and you could pull out uh, just the track, the audio track, if you wanted so to. That would or be kind of like cool because then you can kind of mix and match what you want. Sure. Yeah, I want to talk about Handbrake. This is where you need to go mm-hmm. next. If you want to now take this 29 gigabyte file and make it something manageable, make it something that right. plays back on a mobile device, something like that, Handbrake's the way you go. Handbrake is gone from a great tool to a serious professional tool, in my opinion. I you know I now use it to encode uh, the video for the Linux Action Show for all our shows. Oh, okay. Handbrake is the go-to. You see, I, if you look right here, I have a little last 720. Oh, right. I click that, and all of my presets for the right. Linux Action Show file are done. Um, my my bit rate, my my quality settings, everything is pre-done, and and they have a bunch of presets that come built in. So you just pick the device. The one I generally target is Apple TV three. Yep. The reason I do that is it has a really good default mix of quality mm-hmm. to um, speed. This uh, on in Handbrake, there's this little slider right here for uh, constant quality, and right now it says RF twenty. This is sort of like the warp scale. If I turn this down to like fifteen or sixteen. Mm-hmm. I'll take this encoding from a two-hour encoding to a seven-hour encoding. If I brought this oh. all the way up to like an RF seven or six, yeah. this could be a two-day encoding process. So you okay? So really, that slider's how much? It uh, depends on yeah. how much time you want. It's log. Yeah. It's logarithmic, yeah. as mm-hmm. they say. Logarithmic. Mm-hmm. And I uh, honestly, I've <laughs> I I never have really, and I really pay close attention. I really don't see much benefit beyond RF20. Well, and that's the set that, you know, talking about the presets, that's the preset I use on almost everything I have. Uh, yeah. Just because it yeah, really does. Yeah, TV3 is a good yeah. one. And you can see when you go in here, this is something to pay attention to if you've got a disc that has multiple different languages. Mm-hmm. This is where you can double check which audio tracks you're going right. to use. Something Handbrake does really commonly is it takes uh, the built, usually it takes the AC3 track, mm-hmm. which is the raw audio included with the Blu-ray, which is maybe multi-channel. Mm-hmm. It includes that on one channel and then it also includes a, just a stereo mix AAC on another channel. So that way your simpler devices will play that, and your more sophisticated devices will play the 5.1 Dolby mix. That's so it, handy. Yeah, it's really nice the way it does that. It'll also include subtitles. I usually strip all those out. Sure. And then under advanced, if your Blu-ray has them, which it should if you're ripping it yourself, it you also will include all of the chapter markers from the disc in the file. Oh, and then yeah. if your player supports ch- chapters, you can jump around in the file. You can also tag it. Hmm. So if you want to add in the tags here, so that way if you have something like Plex, it might have a better chance of recognizing it. Media discovery becomes a whole lot simpler. Yeah. So you run that, um, and one of the nice things, too, is you can do a queue. So, for example, if I had um, a lot. So Mm -hmm. here you can see... I have all of these Star Trek toss because these right? were already ripped sitting on a drive somewhere. Yeah. You can actually, you know, it's not like so, you're swapping out optical discs. So instead yeah. of so once I so I went through and I just spent one night and I just right. sat there and copied, you know, using Make MKV file after file mm-hmm. after file after file for my Blu-ray because my son's really getting into Star Trek and I don't want him to damage my hundred dollar. Oh yeah, Star right. Trek collection. Yeah, these right? are the original puppies here. Yeah. Right, and uh, those were I didn't even you know those were gifts from family on top right. of that. So in Handbrake, you just simply add to queue. And then you could sit here and you can you can pop in. So if I say source, I can pop in another file. And if I want to use all of the same exact previous settings, the mm-hmm. same bit rate, and it, which you would if you're doing a series, you something generally like that, would, yeah. You just hit pop add to queue, and you can sit here and keep adding to oh, queue, 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 queue. It'll inherit all of the previous settings, and then you just walk away and let it encode for hours. So you want to do hours. TNG season three? Bam! Put yeah. it in a queue. Yep. Go to bed. Right. <laughs> let it do exactly. its work. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly. great. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I did. Yeah. Um, and then I came back the next day, and I was I had it encoded. Now to oh. give you an example, so here here we have uh, Back to the Future right yeah. from the Blu-ray, 23 gigabytes. Right. Now my high quality, very high quality, which is probably beyond what you'd want to use yourself because sure. you don't need to. You don't need to use it this high. After I've encoded it, it's at 10 gigs, so I've cut it more than half. And that's quite substantial because, yeah, it's that's still really and high. I've pl- yeah, it is. 10 gigs is still yeah. very high, but I've played it back. Which is awesome. And I, I, you know, then I look at that and I know I don't see any quality difference between the Blu-ray 
and this encoded version. I've played them side by side, and I can I can see no difference because X two sixty four is amazing. So it's like being able to custom roll your own media experience depending yeah. on what you expect on from your, your preference, media. right? Yeah, on your preferences, totally. And, and I figure yeah. I want to go with 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 things like the Back to the Future trilogy or mm -hmm. Star Trek. I would love if what I encode stands up to a four K display down the road. Yeah, right. Maybe it can't happen, but I want to give it my best shot. That would be great. So you that combine cool. Make MKV with Handbrake and things like MKV Extractor, um, another another tool to sort of uh, snoop around your files and see what uh, you can get from them, like what mm -hmm. audio tracks they are. Like if you want, sometimes you might have a media file that's using MP3 audio or right. Vorbis audio. You don't know you don't know what it's using. Use the program I've mentioned it before on the show. We made it oh, an app pick so a long cool. time ago. Yeah. Media Info, a great app that's available for multiple platforms. Oh, that's the other thing. Make MKV is available for Mac and uh, Lin uh, Windows too. Oh, that's handy. Uh, so, uh, and then you combine that with media info, which will analyze files for you. And, I mean, this is a really handy app because you can kind of, like, if something's not playing back on a device of yours, if you've ripped something and it's getting, um, you might find that when you're playing with Handbrake, certain devices after you've ripped it will have uh, kind of crappy playback or will have they tearing. Can, yep. you, can, you can fire up that file into media info, look at all of the information, encode another version, start with smaller files. Don't right. go right into a big long Blu-ray. Start with like a 30-minute video Try multiple encodings of them, then look all of them in media info, find the one that works by looking at the details in media info, and then set your encodings around that. You can also use media info if there's a video file out there that you've noticed, man, there's a lot of motion or a right. lot of lights, but it still looks really good. What did they do to encode this video? You can take any video file you want, you drop it into media info, you can get the bit rate, the aspect ratio, oh, the audio yeah. codec, the audio bit rate, the, 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 all the info, and then you can just set up your handbrake to emulate those settings. So let's say you found a, like a Kickstarter-funded movie that you really love how the playback, it's just yeah. everything flows great, and you're you like, can, I want if, that. If you, can, you, know, yep. you have to get to the original sure. video file. Mm -hmm. If you can get that, you've got it. There you it. go, and you yeah. can just emulate that. That's great. Media info is one of those, in fact, oh, I don't even know. Let me see if I have it installed, because if I don't. Media info. I gotta get it if I don't, because I love media info. And you can the fact that you can yeah, look it's yeah. uh one point seven one point seven five megabytes. That's, oh wow, that's nothing. Yeah. Man. All right, so now that I have it installed, let's see if I can run it. Media yeah. info. And I'll give you a little demo of it because I know I've talked be about cool. it before on the show, but I really love it. Oh, that's the command line version. Oh yeah, so there's a command line version oh, too. Oh sweet. Um and there is a command line version of uh, the the that MK that MKV extractor GUI, mm -hmm. as the name implies. There's also an MKV extractor command line. That's and the importance of knowing the GUI. There's also okay. a handbrake command line. Yeah, I knew about that, and which is very cool. And there's commands for make MKV on the command line. Mm -hmm. So you see where I'm getting. You yeah. could actually bash all of this. This is true. Mine is very manual process because I have found that works the Now best. imagine that. You bash the whole thing. You could start bashing multiple. Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> you, you can, can have, like, totally you put just, the disk in there. You fire off a shell script. Your family doesn't see you for a weekend because yeah. you're just ripping stuff all weekend long on this bash, right? Yeah, and yeah. Just, oh, that'd be cool. So there you go. Yeah, um, yeah. This has sort of been my solution for taking the Blu-rays that have become popular in my family and, mm -hmm. and sort of protecting them, right. backing them up. Protect your investment. Yeah, exactly. And things like Make MKV and a portable. I've gone with the portable Blu-ray drive because I can m yep. put it on different machines. That's made it real nice. And, I, uh, and personally, I think that's the better way to go simply because you're not taking a performance hit and you have mobility that you would not have with an internal drive. Chatroom yeah. points out, as you would expect, uh, the GUI version of Media Info is Media Info dash GUI. Oh, that's important. Yeah, okay. that would make sense, right? So uh, if I, works. here, I'll do a quick little demo of it. I love uh, that. What's that slide down terminal called? Oh, yeah. Uh, Wake or Quake or something. Yeah, yeah. Wake. Yeah, I have that on my system and I just swear by it. Between so that and the launcher. So let's open a file and then yeah. let's go look at my Back to the Future encoding. Let's go yeah, find there that. Is. So we'll do by modified here. Uh, encoded. Here and, or, or actually, this is a different directory, isn't where I ended up, but I'll oh, show yeah. you. Here's one of our, um, here's one of our, here's TechSnap, last week's TechSnap. Oh, okay. So I opened up last week. So say you watch an episode of TechSnap and you're like, damn, I can't believe how good that looked. That Chris, he's right. so, he's so impressive. <laughs> right. What's he doing? What's I want to, I want to encode my videos just yep. like he does. Yep. You can see here that the overall bit rate of episode 121 of TechSnap was 865 kilobits. You can see that I used AAC audio. Uh, you can see uh, the video resolution here. You can see the frame rate. You can see the codec that I use, the version strong. of that codec. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I think if you, there's even like a different uh, view mode where you yeah, can even you get like. Uh, this is where you get the meat and potatoes. Yeah, here, look, here's my encoder settings. Oh, see, right there. Command line, bam, drop, yep. splat. So know. this yep. is the actual FFmpeg mm. uh, parameters that were used by Handbrake when this was encoded. That's going to set you up with a sweet bash setup. Yeah. So if you see, so you can really, mm -hmm. you know, you can really get in there and okay, this is what I need to do to make it look right, right. and then you can go translate that to. Uh, I mean, to you your talk setup. about consistent. I mean, it's 
<laughs> there it is. Yeah. I mean, so agree. that's that's media info, mm -hmm. and then you combine all these tools together, and you can uh, get your you can get your favorite content oh, yeah. backed up and protected. And then one last bit, and then we'll and then we'll roll on. Because what the problem is is once you have all of this stuff, you now need to organize all of this stuff. Right. It becomes a management headache. Sure. And we've talked about this before, but there's a program out there called Sickbeard. Now, Sickbeard will enable you to pirate as well if you want to. But yeah. what you can actually use Sickbeard for is um, just content management. I, I have pointed it at a directory, and then I do manual processing. And then as I rip these DVDs, um, you see how it says downloaded unknown? Oh, that's because it's ripped. Right. Yeah, I yeah. ripped them myself, so it doesn't yeah. know where it downloaded them sure. from. But so what I do is I point Sickbeard at my DVD rip directory, uh, and then Sickbeard yeah. will go through and say, okay, this is Star Trek Season 3, mm -hmm. Episode 13, A Land of Taurus, or oh, The, the Empath, great. or The Wink of an Eye, and it will then move them, so then I'll show you what that looks and like. And does Wanted also work with local media? So if you uh, get a new DVD set, you rip it, and yeah. it says, oh, it's no longer Wanted. Exactly. Found, oh, that's really handy. So Sickbeard has a real nice so local I know, aspect. So I've, I know what I've ripped and what I haven't mm. ripped. I could mm. use this. I, you know, if, if I could wanted to turn handy. to the dark side, I could turn this around and point sure. it at Usenet and go grab those things. Sure, but sure. I want to rip them myself. Right. Once I have them ripped, Sickbeard will move them from my DVD ripped encoded folder mm -hmm. after I have ran them through Handbrake. It'll, it'll move them from that folder into my Star Trek folder. Oh, that's handy. And you see, in my Star Trek folder, I haven't set up any of this folder structure. From right. this point on, Sickbeard is managing all of this for me. And now if I go oh. into Star Trek, you can see it took the files and if... Uh, oh, it ordered them up, yeah. Yeah, so let's, let's go back and look. So here's the ripped files. Uh -huh. So here's how I named them. In oh, this, right. It changes right? the naming scheme. Instantly. And it oh, went yeah. through and reorganized them and named them by season and episode form. That's much tidier. Right? So it, does, it actually cleans them up in a really nice way. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah much nicer. So you could, <laughs> you know, you could like say, that. all right, I'm good with that. Or you could then have Sickbeard integrate in with Plex. Right. So then Sickbeard tells Plex, hey, by the way, there's now these Star Trek episodes available on the server. Mm -hmm. And so when I go look on Plex, here's the episodes that I've ripped oh, that now Plex great. knows about. So I... I after I've ripped them from Handbrake, after I've ripped them with Make MKV, sent them through Handbrake for encoding, mm -hmm. I no longer touch them. That's great. Sickbeard and Plex manage all of the organization for me from Isn't that point forward. Isn't automation awesome like yeah. that? And because what a time saver that becomes. Now yeah. you can spend your time doing important things like getting more Blu-rays to rip. That's, <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's why, why I well, see Well, and then you know. I don't have to worry about, like, is this the right episode, right? right? Is this the right care. name? No. Mm, it'll sort it. It manages all of that for me and makes it just... Yeah. makes the media just easier to enjoy. I love so, that. I love a, lot, it. a lot of tools we just threw at your face, and all of those have been, you know, Plex has been covered in mm -hmm. Sickbeard. We've covered those in previous yep. episodes. So if those all, if any of those are new to you, just go watch the back catalog right. of the Linux Action Show, and we go into more details on how to set those up in previous gotcha. episodes. And we got everything in the show notes for you for those episodes as well. Boom. All Boom. right, Matt. That's the Linux Action Show's look at backing up your Blu-rays. Back it up. <laughs> It's time for Slash Etsy, and this segment is brought to you by Untangle. That's right, firewalls Ooh. that bring the power of Linux with a very easy-to-use, nice web UI that really almost anyone can use. Untangle firewalls work flawlessly once you have them installed, so you can almost just set them and forget them. They have superior content filtering capabilities. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you guys, when you're picking an edge-of-network device, you really need to think long and hard about something that's going to be supported. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely critical, and something that runs on technology you can trust. That's where Untangle comes in. So go to untangle.com slash last. These guys have a free ISO you can download. You can throw the Untangle software on your own rig, see how you like it, kick the tire, see if it does what you want, be impressed by that UI, and then play with turning on different services to really see how great it can be to manage your network properly, all backed by Untangle. Go to right. untangle.com slash last and check out what they have to offer. And if you use the code LAST20 when you check out, you'll save 20% off an Untangled subscription. And let me tell you guys, these subscriptions, these things are serious. These have, they have one of the most competitive content filters out there, if you've got that sure. as a need. They've got a fantastic spyware and malware filter if you have Windows boxes on your LAN. And they've got great quality of service and VPN options as well that will make managing remote users totally a snap. Untangle.com slash last. Thanks to Untangle for sponsoring slash Etsy. Thank you. So I recently was inspired to replace the router firmware on uh, my TP-Link um, um, wireless AP. I, mm -hmm. I have no need for my cute, quaint little toy right. wireless device that runs Fisher-Price processors <laughs> to actually be a firewall for my network. Sure. It's, it's adorable that some people do that, and I appreciate that maybe you don't do anything for real or serious on your network, but if you do, yeah. you quickly run into limitations with the stock firmware that's on these devices. And on top of that, with all of the recent NSA revelations and 
Heck, there was just a story this weekend about services that can be turned on on these devices using the built-in firmware. In fact, uh, check oh, this wow. out. Uh, Externious network services leave home routers unsecure. This is an article that was on Slashdot. Today's home routers include a multitude of extra functionalities, such as the ability to act as a file and print server. An article on CNET shows how an attacker can use vulnerabilities in these services, such as buffer overflows, directory transversal, race conditions, command injections, and bad permissions to take over a router from the local network without ever knowing the administrative passwords. Oh, that's scary. Now, when you Good. combine this with the well-documented and well-exploited universal plug-and-play flaws that many routers have, and in the past, Cisco devices, we've talked about this on the TechSnap program, mm -hmm. Cisco devices have actually gotten remote updates from Cisco oh. to turn on tracking features. Not no cool. permission from the user at all. Most uncool. Most uncool. Most uncool. And you, gotta, you, just, you always have to wonder when you have a firmware like this that isn't getting updated properly, that does have yeah. remote root access, maybe it's just time to replace that on security grounds as well. But I think you could make the argument for functionality it might be worth it too. There's, Either way. There's several out there. I mean, there's, there's OpenWRT, there's mm -hmm. Tomato. There's, probably there's a lot of really ones. good ones out there. The one I decided to go with was DD-WRT. You can find it at DD-WRT.com. We talked about it a long time ago on the show, and it is fantastic. You go over there, you have a router database, you plug in your router information, it'll tell you if it's supported, and if it is, it'll give you a firmware link. Now, uh, I, I'm using uh, the good old TP-Link WR1043ND. How about that? Huh? Woo, that's a lot of letters. That's catchy. Catchy. I, I like it because it's got a decent processor, and mm -hmm. it's got removable antennae. That helps. Yeah. Especially if one breaks. And the TP-Link firmware is actually pretty good comparatively to other ones, but it's, you know, getting a little, a little long in the tooth. Mm -hmm. And the functionality isn't so awesome. And I love me data. I love getting me stats. I love getting bar graphs. I love having... Data porn. Yeah, totally. exactly. <laughs> and uh, so I loaded... A very, it's so great. So to, to flash a lot of these routers... Mm -hmm. I recommend you use a wired connection. Always use a wired when you're flashing anything with firmware. That's just my personal opinion. Good yeah. call, Matt. Good call. Yeah. So uh, I recommend the wired connection, and then you just go to the firmware update mm -hmm. page. You upload the DDWRT firmware. There's a specific one if you're flashing from factory. So you really need to pay attention to yeah. what you're Yeah, driving. and I've, I'll, I'll link a guide, but it's kinda, it, this part kind of varies depending on your router. So I can't give you a one-all catch-all sure. guide. You upload this firmware to your router. It goes through a regular firmware upgrade process, like the router thinks it's upgrading to a stock firmware. Oh, okay. Reboots the router. Bob's your uncle. When it comes back up, you're running DDWRT. Oh, nice. So here's my DDWRT. And just on the very front page, you get a little data porn right there. I get oh, yeah. CPU usage, good memory, yep, yep, yep. Uh, what services are running. Mm -hmm. If I scroll down, I can see uh, what wireless clients and their relative signal that oh, they see, have. Oh, see, that's... Oh, dude, that's nice. Yeah, right? 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 Yeah, yeah. You know, and this will work as a router too if you want. I, sure. I don't know. I don't know if this thing has the you know the, yeah, the cojones. Yeah. Uh, I've set up my wireless. Depending on your device, if you've got like a link, there's some Linksys routers that have multiple antennas. Mm -hmm. so you can have multiple wireless. You can have an N only and a, and a G only. And I love it, that feature. It lets you do all kinds of love nice stuff. DDWRT is my go-to solution when I want to do an extended wireless network too. So oh. if you've got a house or a building that you need to have uniform coverage, mm -hmm. you can get, what I would recommend is two of the same model routers. You load DDWRT on both of them. It's very easy to link them up and, and extend. And they're basically repeating the signal. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah. Ve it's very easy. Uh, let's take a look over here at status, because this is where you can see some more fun stuff. Remember, I like the data part, oh, right? Yeah. You get my router name, the model. You can see it's a TP link right there with a version of DDWRT. That's so cool. There's the Linux 357 kernel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We That's love that. serious data. You can see this here now. Here's uh, oh, there's a few other cool. there's a, there are a few other things that are very nice from like a uh, wireless management standpoint. If you're having signal problems, yeah. you can go to the wireless tab in DDWRT and tell me what other consumer grade yeah. router is going to be able to do this. You hit site survey, and the the wireless AP actually will do a survey of all the other APs. Now you can get software to do this, but this is built in to yeah, the into a route. Yeah, that's. So I can see that all of, look at look at this. All of my neighbors are jamming up here on channel oh, six. Look yeah, at all these awesome. guys on channel six. Yep. So now I know don't set my wireless to channel six right. because all of my neighbors are on channel six. And if you're having one of these problems where your connection just keeps dropping in and out, even though you've got decent signal, mm -hmm. this might be what's going on. Wireless noise. And you see this button right here where it says join site. Yeah. This is where that where that wireless extender comes oh, in. Oh, so right. If okay, one so of these was one you... of my other APs, oh, that's nice. You just click join. Oh, that's so simple. Yeah, it's very. You got to have a couple oh. other things defined, but yeah, sure, it's very sure. simple. I can see what I can see. What, I can see frequencies. I yeah. can see their uh, signal strength. All of this stuff. I can see stuff if they're that encrypted. Matters. Here's an open one for some reason. Don't well, know. Well, you know, you open. need to go and do some uh, some. Yeah, 
looks saying. like maybe my Roku device has wireless to on for some reason. Oh, that's uh, weird. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, so that's that's a very nice feature built in. And then you also have other things like you can get real time bandwidth charts. So if you've got people on your wireless, you can you can run these charts to see like the different signal. Or if you're copying files, you want to watch it. You can all of oh, that. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, so it's this really just full featured crazy. Oh, it is so great, man. And and the great oh, part man. is is that it's it takes a firmware that was sort of collecting dust on right. my router and brings totally new functionality and new life into it. And this was updated as of like a month ago. This oh, firmware man. is pretty current, right? right. And there versus got that ancient dated stuff you had before. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, there are tons and tons of reason tons and tons of reasons to DWRT, including NAT and quality of service. One of the things mm -hmm. I think I might play with on our wireless network is uh, we use in some instances, um, some network screen captured software yeah. that uh, that works over wireless. But if someone else in the house decides they want to stream Netflix, right. totally it, drains away. To and if you're if you're doing a show live, like I can't get up and go like, hey, go turn off Netflix. Exactly, you kind of you screwed. Yeah, it's screwed. So doing something like quality of service will just say, ah, yeah. give preference to the wireless uh, screencasting traffic. So there's a lot of things you can play with in here. That's Nice. DDWRT. It's an open source firmware that you can replace on your stock stock router. They got a, they got a compatibility database. You can go check yeah. them out. There's also lots of other good ones. So if you guys have played around with another replacement firmware that you love, mm -hmm. let us know about it in the feedback thread in the yeah. subreddit for this episode. Maybe we'll play with that in a future slash Etsy. That would be cool. All I'm right, gonna be guys, checking this out when I get home. Go out there and flash your router. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. But Matt, mm -hmm. before we get out of here, I thought maybe we'd cover a little feedback. What oh, do you yeah. say? Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, I thought I saw a thread that was started by ooh, 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 by ooh. in our subreddit okay. and it's called the Ubuntu Sweepstakes. Matt, that's right. The Ubuntu Sweepstakes have been announced in our subreddit where everybody tries to guess what the final funding amount of Ubuntu's Edge Indiegogo campaign will be. Yeah, okay. So there you go. Uh, ooh, 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 started this thread over there. Uh, and he's trying to guess uh, how much money in the Ubuntu Edge Indiegogo. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, he says, here's the rules. You're not allowed okay. to duplicate guesses. You can only sure. submit a guess $1 or higher than the lore that someone <laughs> else's guess. So you got to read the thread. <laughs> Entries are allowed until the 8th of August. Okay. Last-minute con contributions from wealthy individuals, even those who happen to be directly related to Canonical, do count. Oh. The judge's decision is final. Mm -hmm. And there is no prize except for the uh, joy of victory. However, I say we change that last part. I, I, yeah, bit, Bitcoin pool. Seriously. I, Bitcoin pool. Okay, now you're getting crazy. <laughs> yeah, because that's you know, so gambling, shmambling. Who cares? You there can prove some, it. You know? There are some Bitcoin betting sites for that saying. kind of thing. I was thinking we'll give away a Steam game to the winner. There you go. So whoever gets closest to the price within a dollar, you know, I, you know we'll, we'll, we'll do standard game show rules, price yeah. is right rules. Right, right. With, uh, so if you go over, hmm, how does that work exactly? Because we all know what the fixed. Uh. Anyways. You got to guess what you think the final funding is going to be at, yep. and you can't go over. So I guess seems reasonable. It's only assuming it doesn't reach thirty-two million dollars. I, I don't think it's going to go. <laughs> if it does go over, it's going to be by a slither. Hey, well, chat room's already guessing. Look at chat room's like, oh, I got, I got this. I got this. <laughs> Forty million. <laughs> no, you guys, you got to go over to yeah. the thread and submit it there because that's where we'll go to tally everybody up. We'll have that linked in the feedback section. Ought to be the in the show subreddit. Notes. And then uh, we'll give away a copy of a new Steam game, a fresh new Steam game, to the winner. Uh, all right, I wanted to follow up on uh, Aussie Roy's thread because I thought it'd be a good chance for you and I to talk yeah, about yeah. it. Uh, he says he failed the Arch Challenge. Mm. He's just kind of reached the point where yeah. it was just, you know, he's been in computers for years. Back to 1983 is when he, he uh, was really getting into stuff. Well, I like the fact that he really gave some background on his experiences. Yeah. That, was, that was good. Yeah, and he just kind of, to him, he felt like he had some challenge installations uh, with, cha with, uh, with the, he had some challenges with the installation. He got sure. past that. Hit some other road bumps and just kind of burned out and said, you know, it's not really, it hasn't really been worth it to him. Right. And he's wondering, like, what's the trade off? Like, is it worth all this time right. investment? And I'm just kind of curious. I thought we'd update you and I. Yeah. Are you still running Arch? I have. So here's the thing, and I'm going to get flamed for this. No, that's all right. Be, but, be I, honest, but, I, but I'll be honest. I, you know, I do have Arch on a separate partition, I, and it's fine. I do. The only thing I ever do with it is I update it. I oh, don't, really? I don't really use it. I have Manjaro on another partition, same computer. And I keep the because my goal when I first did this is I really heard about all the the negative about the Using derivatives. The derivatives. Yeah, and so I was like, all right, so I'm going to try this out and really try and keep. I mean, I know they use separate repos. Arch is always newer. I know all, I I know all the history. I'm not new to this. I get it. So you know it, what's interesting is they're both intact. They both work really well. Yeah. 
Um, the you know, and what com what I found is I began to notice that the whole reason why I was using Arch really was because I like the Arch user repositories. The rest of it, yeah. I don't care. So I found myself using Manjaro more just because it really felt pretty seamless for my experience. Yeah. Um, Arch had a little bit newer stuff, but other than that, it I was think, pretty. Eh, I know. think that's an interesting. <laughs> I run a three ten kernel. I think the biggest problem you know, that a lot of know. people have is that Arch setup is so. Like yeah. it's like this massive task for them. Yeah. I think Manjaro sort of makes it easier. I think it's interesting that you've been running it for a while without issue. Well, and I wanted to run it not as I, you know, Arch was hard and I stopped using it and I used it in Manjaro. No, no, no. I want to run both so that I can really get the meat and potatoes of both experiences and, and understand those differences. And there are some different, very big differences. Manjaro is not Arch. It is based on Arch. I think I figured out That's where that differentiator. I think maybe where the core where people why people don't like the derivatives comes yeah. from is Arch's secret sauce is that whole keep it simple mentality sure. where... Well, you're taking responsibility for your desktop, really. right? That's right? really and the meat and potatoes of it. And everything's filed down to, like, total minimal. Mm -hmm. Like, I just like the other day, I realized I don't have a network manager installed. Like, I, yeah. I, I meant to install that. Yeah, I never got around to yeah. it. And, and just, you may not even need it. I mean, depending on what you're doing, you may not so think about it. This is why things don't break as much. Because right. if you, you just only have what you need, and sure. so because it's simpler, it... Like, I've been running this now You have for, less moving parts to have break yeah, in an Arch install, exactly. which can be a real benefit. And I think Manjaro you know. and Antegoros and those other ones yeah. sort of add a little more complexity that adds they, more... They can and do. I have I tested out a couple of the other derivatives. I didn't really care for them so much. I, I came back to Manjaro simply because of the way that they... I love the fact that the kernel updates are completely separate from the oh, rest really? of it. I love See, that. I like getting my kernel updates from Arch because I know. feel like I get, like, of course, you got three ten. I got three ten. Yes. Oh, and here's what's cool. I needed uh, for uh, for some testing purposes. I needed to roll back to a legacy kernel. There was I could do that easily and have you know I had three ten and like three four or something like that mm -hmm. on there. Just a real variety of stuff going on. It was kind of fun to play with that. Huh. Um, yeah. I mean, if you want to try something different, you want to try another distro. I won't say like Arch. You want to try another distro. Manjaro is fun. It's cool. If you're a happy Arch user, you're probably not going to like it because you are using Arch because you want that roll your own experience. Yeah. And I'd say stick with that. But, I, I find the longer I run Arch, the harder the idea of moving away from it becomes because uh -huh. of the uh, Arch user repo, but also uh, just that I really like getting the latest software. I, right. I'm all about like... I have the most stable release, the current stable release of every Dropbox is everything. my favorite one. Yeah, when, when you go to yeah. the Arch user repository, but I'm getting that Manjaro too. I literally, yeah. you can you can yeah. run uh, what is it, yogurt or yogurt? Or yeah, whatever Manjaro. Call it. You know, if I had to reload and I need to do it in a couple of hours or yeah. something, Manjaro might be the way I go. It, it's it's interesting. I don't know. I might try it. Sometime. The the only the big downside I see to Manjaro is that if you're an Arch user, you are getting bleeding edge stuff, not just in the Arch user repositories, but also in the Arch repositories proper. You're actually getting that that latest stuff. Manjaro stuff's usually about a month old, maybe a little older maybe a little newer it depends if you're using stable or unstable um there's a mm -hmm. little more flexibility there okay and some people aren't okay with that and so and yeah. you're certainly not going to be taking control of your desktop with Manjaro. that's a ro that's not a roll your own solution by any stretch you right you're not building it from the ground no up. if yeah. you want to really understand how linux works i recommend having an arch i think it was i think it was well stated so. in the subreddit that uh i mean arch is a hobbyist distro and then yes. there's like different, like just like cars, there's like build your own car kits. And then there's mm -hmm, car right. kits that are like pre assembled and you just kind of add on a few parts yourself. You know, and there's, you go out and buy a completely totally. pre made car. And I, I think that's really what it comes mm -hmm. down to. And of course, then you have, you can get to Gen 2 and Linux from scratch. And you go, oh, that, yeah. that analogy goes even further. I think for, for scratch distros, I say Arch is good, would be my go to place just because they've really refined it in a way that works well. As long as you follow the instructions, yeah. it's pretty self explanatory. Yeah. Um, you know, it's something I would encourage everybody to try either in a, a preferably on a, a separate partition. I don't like it so much in VirtualBox, but um, yeah, mm. try it on a try it on okay. a partition, run it, see if you like it, play with it, you know, toy around with it. I enjoyed it. Pedro writes in via bit message. He says, "Hi, Chris and Matt. I just watched your Linux drive recovery episode, and I've been thinking for a long time about finding a storage solution for my data. Mm -hmm. I'm a mu musician, and I have approximately 1.5 terabytes of video files from my lessons and oh, wow. concerts, all duplicated across three drives." I've had one of those die on me a couple of months ago, and I'm scared to lose data. Right. Also, the system doesn't scale well at all. My drives yeah. are almost full, and as soon, I'll have to buy two external one terabyte drives or more. I'm wow. considering one of the four bay hard drive enclosures and that have RAID without needing to connect to a computer. I was looking at this one, and it includes a, a Media mm -hmm. Sonic store link to a, a Media Sonic Pro Box 4. Okay. Uh, I was wondering how well these would work with Linux, specifically with Linux file systems like Extended 4 yeah. or ButterFS. Mm -hmm. You know, if something like this will recognize the drives if they are in that format, or RAID drives format in a different file mm -hmm, system. Mm -hmm. Any recommendations would be appreciated. So he's dealing with, wow. I think, a problem that more and more folks are dealing with, where we have a lot more to store, 
And Linux um, is not awesome compared to like the BSDs at this. No. no this no, is something no. I want to talk about more uh, this week. Uh, so here's the uh, four box. You see that guy right there? Oh, that's pretty. I've got. That's Nash. I like it. It's shiny. Oh, got some weight to it. So this was bought by an audience member uh, for cow. the Linux Action Show. I have the 8-drive bay version of that right here next to oh, me. Oh, yeah. Uh, mine, however, is not working because I believe my controller does not support uh, multiplexing. Oh. Now, he's looking at a different, a slightly different unit. His unit... Um, oh, slightly different shapes. Slightly well, his small. is only four drives for one. Oh, okay. Now, uh, this one does not do RAID. He... I don't think. He wants one like that it. you put the drives in there, and mm -hmm. it has a RAID controller built into the unit. Oh, right, right. So what, would that be hardware RAID? Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually a great way to go. Uh, and then mm -hmm. he was asking about formatting. That will just show up to Linux as one drive. So if you put four oh, drives in there, and then you right. do RAID in this unit, and the way these uh, Pro Box work is you'll just have a little selector along mm -hmm. the top, and you'll get a little LED light, and you'll say, I want RAID 5, I want RAID whatever, and you choose oh. that on there, and then it will... It will do the RAID internally, and then you will attach it to your Linux box, and you will format it with any file system you want. That's kind of cool. I like that. Yes, yeah, so that's yeah. that's one solution, and I think probably that'd be. I mean, for someone like me who is RAID ignorant, I probably go that direction. Yeah, that is really nice to just have that box because then you don't have to worry about setting up RAID on your computer. Uh -huh. I also prefer hardware RAID, just to be honest. I know a lot of you guys out there support Linux software RAID. I'm a hardware rig guy if I can. Kiss principle. Or I like to use ZFS. Now, this is an area where I feel like I'm going to talk about more. I didn't get a chance to go into the storage stuff. All the drives are here. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. all in the array, Good but my, my controller apparently is not working. So we'll do a segment next week about using ZFS and attaching all of these drives. So you nice. might get more of an answer next week, but you're, you're, in the, you're going in the right direction. It is, it is a challenge. So it sounds like, yeah, as you said, he's going in the right direction and to definitely tune in for next week so that yeah. he can actually learn you know, further. As, and assuming I get the storage work. Assuming. Yeah. So uh, Spazzy C writes in. He says, hello, Chris and Matt. At the company I work at, we have an internet server running, Microsoft Windows Server 2003 R2. What mm -hmm. I didn't know until recently was it is not running IIS, but using uh, ZAMP, which is a uh, uh, Apache, MySQL, mm -hmm. PHP, all bundled up in one. Sure. Given the age of the build... Oh, by the way, he says they brought in outside contractors, and they just ripped through the server. Oh. An old Windows box with an old ZAMP installation. So now they've got to replace it. And so they said, given the age of the build, we're just thinking a whole new server. After looking at ZAMP and seeing that it's Apache with a lot of stuff turned on, we want to cut down the attack area and deploy Linux with only the web components as necessary. Our user base is about 3,000 users with only a tiny fraction ever accessing the Internet at the same time. Mm -hmm. The old server only had about 10% utilization. We'll be deploying this in a VMware 5 environment. As we, are, as we are a complete window shop, now here's the key part. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Which distro would you recommend we implement to get our toes wet in the Linux gene pool? I've listened to a lot of the conversations you've had with Alan from TechSnap as well, so would you recommend deploying Nginx or FreeBSD? Mm -hmm. Thanks for musings you send my way. Spazzy C. Well, he's a blank slate, so it really provides a lot of... Uh lot of options because he doesn't have a defined loyalty to one thing or another. I think the fact that they're a window shop is big. A mm -hmm. yeah. um, couple of reasons. One is they might end up having to rely on outside contractors from time to time right. when they need stuff done. So they need to go with something that outside contractors are going to have familiarity with. That way they get you know a good contractor mm -hmm. and they get the best bang for their buck. Sure. So I think that limits them right there to three distros. Okay. Uh, SUS Enterprise Linux, CentOS, or Ubuntu long-term support. Wow. Right? And I think... When you look at it this way... Um, I didn't expect to hear Ubuntu in there, but I guess that makes sense. That I would take CentOS off the list myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? I just don't like CentOS. It's just not happening. No okay. offense to you guys, but I just, I just don't like CentOS. <laughs> um, so uh, I would take CentOS off the list. I uh -huh. would probably focus on either um, uh, OpenSUSE, OpenSUSE mm -hmm. Enterprise Server or Ubuntu Long-Term Support. And I would probably, since you are a Windows shop... I would probably refine that one notch further and say you probably want to look at Ubuntu long-term support. If you install wow. a piece of software called Task Cell, Task S E L, mm -hmm. then you just simply do Task Cell install lamp server oh. on Ubuntu. There's a command. I'll have the command linked right here in the show notes. Right. Task Cell. So you're, you're, that's you're saying Task Select install lamp server, and oh. the Task Selector will go out and install Apache, MySQL, and PHP for you. Oh, that's kind. And of... it'll just do a minimal setup. It'll run you through some guides. So you set the root password for MySQL. Right. So it keeps it secure, and you're done. That's interesting. So what, what's the benefit of uh, using, like, I mean, why would why you Ubuntu? just use, yeah, I, well, not just Ubuntu, but why not just use apt? I mean, what would be the... Well, this does use apt. Okay, well, I mean, initially, okay. But because they don't know. 
I mean, because they've never set up a LAMP server, and so uh, okay. um, the the nice thing is, is this uh, so it's, is, get, it's fetching all the stuff for you, so you yeah. don't have to. Uh, that makes yeah. sense. Okay. And because it's Ubuntu, it's going to be well supported by a vendor, and it's well supported by VMware gotcha. out of the box. Right. So you're deploying something that's got long term support. You're deploying something that has a high contractor support ratio. You're deploying right. something that's very easy to get LAMP installed with uh, basic knowledge. And last but not least, you're deploying something that has really good VMware integration. Good so argument. I think out of okay. all of those things, OpenSUSE Enterprise Server or Ubuntu LTS would be my suggestion mm -hmm. with the preference to Ubuntu LTS for what you guys need to do. Good to know. All right. Next email comes in from Erez. He mm -hmm. says, Dear Matt and Chris, mm -hmm. two thoughts on the last episode, Season 28, Episode 1. First, on the subject of canonical crowdfunding project, Matt assumed that the project will reach a peak and then start to peter out. In That's the episode of NPR podcast Planet Money, and he links us to that, they show that it's usually not the case that a graph is actually reversed, that with two peaks, one at the beginning and one at the end. So you got your, you got your big yeah. funding, then a lull, and then big funding. Well, and, and I'm, unless I'm forgetting what I said, I'm fairly certain that I said it would peter out, and then at the end someone's going to come in like Han Solo and a Millennium Falcon and basically Maybe. Drop, drop a yeah. lump of some. And I'm not saying I, I may change that mind, but I think that I believe that's what I said last week. I'd have to rewatch it to know for sure. Uh, um, chat rooms, sorry, just to jump back. Uh, chat rooms yeah, also yeah. pointing out that uh, I didn't mention this, but one of the reasons, sorry to jump around. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mentioned OpenSUSE is because uh, as a Windows admin shop, you guys might find Yast. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. Right, to get true. Apache up yeah, and going. Yast yeah. is pretty awesome. Yeah. Okay. All right, so, anyways. Fine. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I believe that's what I said last week is basically, you know, it was going to dip down, and then at that very last minute, someone's, gonna, you know, there's going to be some serious fundage dropped. Now, that's not to say that's accurate, but I think that's what I said. I'm, yeah. I'm fairly certain. All right. So, I, I think that's what you said. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to – it's not gospel. I, I'd have to look again. I don't remember. But <laughs> Second, on React OS, once you described it and actually how it looks and plays, I was somewhat disappointed. I always assumed mm. the project was created to create a better OS that uses the Windows API right. and not duplicate Windows. Sort of a good implementation of the API. But your analysis made me think that I might be wrong here, that the API is tied to the GUI and you cannot implement it in a way that would not end up looking like a Windows GUI. Exactly. This is not surprising, assuming this is the case, since unlike Linux, Windows has a graphic rendering in the kernel, mm -hmm. and so they could standardize many things by simply assuming everything will look the same and act the same. This feeling strengthened when you started mentioning that where they could diverge from Windows user experience, they did, and did improve on the original implementation. Love to hear what you think of this. I think you nailed it. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. Yeah, I... I don't know how I, much, I can't add to that. But whenever you like, you know, whenever you run a a Windows app under Wine, it always mm -hmm. kind of has that Windows look to it. Um, yeah, it's really hard to kind of retheme all that. Now you yeah. can get, you could, you can apply textures on top of it, but mm -hmm. that's a hack. Well, and they're doing good work. I just, you know, I think they need to kind of figure out where they're going because it just feels like it's, it just becomes further and further behind the more they go. It just, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's yeah. You gotta. It's tough. The only way I really see React OS long term working out is really when the Windows Empire is kind of the sun is set. People are not really actively developing for it anymore. That would be a fix. And then yeah, React OS right. can kind of catch up, and then React OS becomes that compatibility layer we all use mm -hmm. to use those legacy. That Win32 would be apps. pretty cool, actually. Okay. We'll see. Yeah, it's going happen. Jay writes in, and he wants us to revisit our thoughts on GNOME. Loving last, been watching for a long time, and in the early days of GNOME, such as GNOME 3.0, mm -hmm. I agree with a lot of the frustration remarks that were said, like the lack of power menu comes to yeah. mind. The more I use GNOME, and he's using uh, version 3.8, okay. the more I'm beginning to like it. As time goes on, I find that there are a tremendous amount of rough edges within the KDE environment. The over-the-top colors that make me feel like I'm in an anime, <laughs> and the up-and-down misalignment, and rather small little things like text in the clock widget, etc., have caused me to really appreciate the aesthetics of GNOME 3.8. The integration of online accounts is great as well. I keep hearing that KDE is fabulous and amazing, and the truth be told, I think it is, but there are so many rough edges that I feel like GNOME is just edging ahead quite a few notches. The aesthetics I mentioned above, the lack of video streaming across SMB on a LAN, that's a huge one for me, mm -hmm. uh, and the lack of exchange integration, etc., etc., have all kind of amounted to my current stance. I'm curious if you guys revisited GNOME 3.8 and see if your previous three opinions would be any different with GNOME 3.8. Thanks for your time, Jay. I haven't revisited it lately, so I need to actually spend some time and do some common tasks that I would normally do under uh, XSCE, which I'm really happy with, to see how that mirrors to it. I would agree with you on KDE. Too. I think that it definitely has some fairly significant rough edges that are uh, almost deal breakers in some instances. I, uh, um, um, sorry, I'm getting a private message from oh, no worries. Uh I, I switched from GNOME 3.8 to KDE 4.10. Mm -hmm. So I actually was running GNOME 3.8 at first, and I liked it a lot. 
The only major thing I came up with is I realized that, first of all, I'm not so sure the direction of the GNOME desktop. I'm still not fully comfortable there. Right. And um, I'm also not totally clear on the long-term viability of GTK versus QT. That's in a, that's one area that I'm I have concerns over. I'm not as concerned by it as I am watchful of it. I'm I'm wa kind of waiting to see how that reacts because I am seeing QT really push forward with its development stuff, and I'm not seeing a lot in the GTK. And so I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah. Um. And, the other, and lastly, yeah. um. I also just uh, the the amount of um, plugins that I need to get mm -hmm. working to make GNOME functional True. extensions uh, kind of makes me nervous, and I'm worried that it's going to break. Whereas KDE, all of that's built in. Yeah, and I yeah. I do suffer from KDE oddities. Like I really am annoyed by the way it handles audio. Uh, um, right, after yes. about six or seven days of uptime, for some reason, right. Dolphin becomes unmanageably slow to open and close. F open I a file. I wonder if there's some weird caching thing going on. Like there's yeah. some big um, data file that's being piled I, into. Not I that know. I can tell. You know, I've uh, I've ran uh, tracing tools and yeah. I've ran IO top, and I don't see like. Um, so so what I have what I have happening, in fact, if anybody knows a fix to this, when I launch Dolphin or any or any QT app that uses the standard KDE open and save dialogue, mm -hmm. a minute to two minutes before it'll display, um, like on the click of the icon. And see, I've seen that on on XFCE, and there was a fix for it there, and I wonder if the same. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'll have to check. For don't that. know. Yeah. If I reboot, it goes away. Right. Yeah. Same. So that's odd. But uh, I I did a lot of I a lot of con lot of discussion threads, but. Uh, Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, before we go on, uh, uh, Minures, I think, I don't know, Minures, Minures, mm -hmm. Minures, he writes in, he says, I just want to know if you guys saw this $99 Intel PC, or $199 Intel mm -hmm. PC that's going on sale. They call it the Minnow Board. It. Yeah, I've yeah. heard about it. I haven't really dug that deep into it, but I have heard of it. Yeah, it's going to be an open source uh, PC that's supposed to sort of compete with uh, the Arduino or the Raspberry Pi, I suppose. That's cool. Going to have an x86 processor on it, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I haven't really got a chance to look at it. It I'm, could be it could be interesting. Could be pretty cool. You know, it'd be nice if it had real like a deal breaking for the other guys. Different. I'm always thing. skeptical of the Intel uh, stuff. It always seems like I don't know. Dollar short, too late. Yeah, yeah they're always too <laughs> they're always too late, and they're always promising these yeah. cool devices that never ship. And they're like, oh well, that was just an example. That was just a reference. Now maybe this one's different, right? I think that's actually they're they, actually they need. To, they're fighting to be relevant. I mean, yeah. with the decline of the desktop, as they say. I mean, they say I, I'm I'm always on the fence on the. No, but the one thing is for sure is there's a hell of a lot of ARM chips that are selling that they're not yeah. making any money on. Yeah, right. This is true. Yeah. This is true. So yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. If you guys would like to send your feedback in, which we still have a bunch, mm -hmm. but we'd love to hear from you. Email the Linux Action Show at JupiterBroadcasting.com, or you can find our bit message address in the show notes and send yep. us an awesome bit message. Yes. There's also the subreddit over at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Always a good way to get a hold of Matt, us. where should we send people to find you throughout the week? Uh, we are actually on Monday going to be hosting a... Oh, yeah. You know, we got a little uh, yeah, the open, contest. Yeah, the, the open source uh, caption contest for so opensource.com. that's probably the best place to find us. Yeah, we'll be tweeting that out and uh, Google Plusing and all of that stuff. So that'll yeah. be on Monday. Uh, we'll be the judges. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to remember That'll exactly what time it is. It's in my calendar. Right. It's Monday afternoon, like, yeah. A one or two. Like, or uh, somehow, some way... Uh, we're supposed to review 170 submissions or so. Yeah, sure. And I'm going to do all of that between this moment, Coda Radio, and all of that. I don't know exactly how that's all going to work out, but we will be doing that Sunday. Uh, and we're yeah. going to have a lot of fun. It'll be on a live Google Hangout yep, uh, okay. session. You can find more info. I'll try to tweet it out when we Tomorrow. start. Tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in this week's, up, uh, uh, this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. Easy for me to say. Easy right? for you to say. We'll see you right back here next week. Oh, oh, see, there we go. <laughs> oh, this Except is, for you know, the this thing has got to go. You can't put it in the reporting show. Those look show, like but. those look like woman boobs. Those when you when it photoshops. Well, you've been, you've been upgraded. Clearly. When you Photoshop it, it looks like you put my head over a woman. It looks like a woman. Those look like except for the hair. Oh, okay. No, oh, <laughs> I just, oh. It's it's too much. It's too much. Oh man, that's awesome. <laughs> oh. Oh, that woke me up. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Hello. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Little, little Mr. Sulu there. Oh, my. <laughs> I'm saying. Yep. <laughs> Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Well, <laughs> I'm not sleeping tonight. All right. We got another. Oh, hey, Matt. Oh. Oh. Hey, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Want to have the most fun you've ever had watching a game show? Yeah! All you need is a set. <laughs> this is the new. This is the new storage array, and these wow. are the drives. So there's the drives. Oh, cool. Yeah, and uh, uh, I got each drive marked with the person who sent it. 
Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, and there it is, empty. There's a storage array thingy, empty. Wow. Uh, Another one from, <laughs> here, let's see. Let's see this, this one's from Slip, so let's see if this is maybe a little more palatable. Oh, that's really good! Actually, that's excellent. Okay, now that's very, very, very good. Oh, Slip's with the win! Save that bad boy now. All right, okay, okay. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm starting I need to unsee that other image. Right. Yeah, really? <laughs> I was like, ah! I know. Now, does anybody have anything hot to kind of clean the palette? Because, woo! Let's go back and Google some of those uh, videos we are doing earlier. That is great, though. That is a really good one. <laughs> yeah, it was excellent. Thanks, Slips. Exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> the other one, not so much. <laughs> hey! <laughs> shake it off, shake oh, it off. Don't think about it, Matt. Don't think about it, Matt. Don't think about it, Matt. Don't think about it. Oh, wow.